So yeah, if you could just roughly outline for the listeners how much protein is needed to build muscle. Yeah, Abel, that's a great question. And you know, several studies have looked at this problem and compared people who eat different amounts of protein and... And also on top response. of that, not just studies, but also meta-analyses have been carried out to examine this question. Oh my God, stop interrupting me. In the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast, we believe in the interviewer not interrupting the guest, or at least not talk straight over the guest. All right, guys, so this is SSD, Sustainable Self-Development, a podcast for people who want to get ahead in fitness and in life without driving themselves crazy. So if you want to look up a year from now and think, damn, I came a long way, but you don't want to burn out in the process as you get there, you came to the right place. We'll get into today's episode in just a second, but just want to let you know that we have an awesome community on Facebook in the form of a group which you can join, where we discuss and debate things, drop ideas. Ideas, debate over which person to interview for the next podcast and all that good stuff. So go to Facebook, type in sustainable self-development, or you can just check the show notes here and click the link there and you'll find the sustainable self-development Facebook group and you can join. Also, I'm not sure where you're listening to this right now, but this podcast is available on a variety of platforms, iTunes, SoundCloud, Podbeam, and YouTube. You can find it on all of these platforms if you just type in sustainable self-development because luckily nobody is weird enough to name themselves in such a way except me. So look me up on these places and follow the show by subscribing so that you don't miss future episodes. And with that, let's get into the show. So yeah, if you could just roughly outline for the listeners how much protein is needed to build muscle. Yeah, Abel, that's a great question. And you know, several studies have looked at this problem and compared people who eat different amounts of protein and... And also on top of that, not just studies, but also meta-analyses have been carried out to examine this question. Oh my God, stop interrupting me. In the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast, we believe in the interviewer not interrupting the guest, or at least not talk straight over the guest. All right, guys, in this episode, I want to address the story of my rapid fat loss that has taken place about nine months ago at this point, uh, because this was a time period in my life which I often refer back to as that being kind of a big turning point for me. And I want to tell you the story because if you listened to past episodes of mine, you'll hear me very often emphasizing the importance of normalizing one's mindset and relationship with nutrition and training and having a healthy, non-obsessive behavior relative to their own baseline, of course. Um, and that at certain times, fat loss and attempting rapid fat loss especially is not the best idea if your goal is that to normalize your relationship with your nutrition and training journey on the whole. And if you listen to some of my past episodes, I told parts of my story here and there, and you'll notice that I had talked about losing quite a bit of fat at one point, while in the meantime, normalizing my relationship with food, and that after that, I've been able to maintain my new body fat levels and my new normalized mindset at the same time. So, you know, apt listeners will point out that, hold on, dude, you're preaching one thing, and then your personal example speaks of an entirely different thing. Thing. And that's right. You know, when someone comes to me and asks me, man, I've been yo-yo dieting or permacutting for a while. I binge purged and went up and down on the, you know, 10 to 15% body fat percentage scale like four times in this past couple of months. And then now I'm whatever, 16, 17 or 20% body fat and I'm really unhappy with my state and want to cut, but I'm not sure if it's, if that's the best idea. What, what do I do? You know, this is a very common situation that I encounter and understand. You know, I have been in this state myself. Most notable one was just over a year ago when I found myself in this limbo of not being overly happy with my body and physique, but at the same time, kind of knew that cutting might not be the best idea. And I reflected on this moment of mine in a video, which I will link in the show notes. The title is Cut or Bulk, reflecting on an old video of mine. And so basically the moral of that video is, if you are currently in a state of a very messed up relationship with your nutrition, if you have yo-yoed a lot, if you binge purged, if you permacut, if your hunger and satiety signals are all out of whack and are unpredictable, and more importantly, if you have no trust in yourself, or rather if you have no reason to trust yourself uh, that things will be different this time if you lose all the weight you wanna lose, 
your first and foremost priority is not trying to lose fat, but it is to optimize and normalize your relationship with nutrition. And the best way to do that is to spend some time at maintenance and just to eat normally. Uh, eat just enough at all times to feel good. You know, don't go hungry and try to push through hunger too much and just establish a normal eating pattern again. And basically do this for, you know, anywhere between four and maybe 12 weeks and see this as a test of source that you need to pass. And once you have eaten normally for that amount of time, you can go ahead and try to get rid of the fluff that you don't want. And that's not what I did. You know, in my case, something drastic happened that overnight changed my psychology and that triggered a chain of events. And, you know, over the course of maybe two months, so many things happened to me uh, that I just found myself in this storm of, you know, excitement and stress and pain and happiness. And in the midst of all of that, I did, in fact, go through a rapid fat loss phase. You know, I lost a lot of fat. And the reason why I want to tell you this story is because something interesting happened to me recently, which is a guy reached out to me and told me his story. Um, if he's listening to this, he will know that this is him. Uh, so he told me his story, which was the very common situation that I just outlined, which is he had, he had a lot of yo-yoing in the past, had some binge purge periods, uh, and now he was in this limbo of I'm too fat to my liking, but I am also burnt out on dieting as hell, and doing a cut will probably just fuel my fucked up relationship with food. And so I initially told him my standard advice that, you know, dude, don't try to lose fat right now, eat that maintenance for a while, and after that, go ahead with your cut if you want. So he thanked me and said that he would go ahead with my advice. And then he returned to me a few weeks later saying that uh, I did what you said and I feel like my relationship is quite a bit more normal with food. And in fact, I also met a girl that I like, uh, but my confidence is a little bit low because I'm not very happy with my body. I'm about 20% body fat. So I thought of getting rid of like 15 pounds. And then he told me that um, he, was, he heard my episode in which I talked about how I lost a lot of weight in a short-term period and how I normalized my relationship with food in the meantime, which again goes against my kind of standard message. And so he asked me how much fat I lost and how fast. And so I told him I went from maybe 16% body fat to maybe 9 or 10% body fat in about a month, maybe a bit less, and, and that I would not recommend that fast of a pace to anyone. And then he asked me, uh, you know, I just just want to know what you did, you know, if you don't mind, tell me, not because I want to copy what you did, but I want to know what's realistic. Uh, you know, it was kind of funny, it actually um, reminded me of when I was in uh, college, and I wrote sometimes to some classmates of mine saying that, hey, um, could you send me your assignment? I don't want to copy it, I just want to compare it with mine. <laughs> but anyway, so, and I, so I told him, well, but you know what's realistic, you want to lose like 15 pounds, you can lose that in 15 weeks with a slower cut, in 10 weeks with a faster cut, or in five weeks if you want to crash diet. You know, it all comes down to creating a calorie deficit. As for what I did, it's all in there in the intuitive eating episode. Uh, there I outlined how to create the biggest deficit possible without tracking calories. But basically, I just ate foods that satiated me the most and I ate very mindfully. And, you know, then it hit me that even though this guy was very bright and, and he clearly had a lot of above average self-awareness, it kind of became clear that he was in a way looking for some kind of a magical recipe that would allow him to go through a rapid fat loss phase while not having a healthy relationship with nutrition and quote unquote get away with it. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to pick on this guy whatsoever because it's completely understandable that he is interested in ways to make a rapid fat loss phase work. I mean, rapid fat loss is always appealing. I mean, having more fat on our bodies than what is aesthetically pleasing for us is not too desirable. And if we do want to lose fat, doing it slowly and steadily, where we are just eating a little bit less than what we would want for a long period of time is also not too desirable. On the other hand, losing a lot of fat fast, I mean, everything is appealing about that shit. You get to your desired look faster and you don't need to spend a lot of time eating less than what you would want. Uh, the only thing that's not appealing about it is the higher hunger that you need to put up with temporarily, but it's, you know, it's a short-term period, so otherwise it's game on pretty much. So it's very much understandable that even if someone understands that rapid fat loss is not what's going to serve them the best in that given moment, 
if they get a sense that there might be a way to make that work, they want to know how to do it. I get it completely. It's human nature. You know, I myself am like that with a lot of things. Like, um, you know, I know that doing party drugs is not a very viable way to live if you want to be healthy and not destroy your brain and your life. But if there is a way to get around this, like, I would want to know about that shit. So I guess this guy heard my story that I was just like him, having messed up food habits and a history of yo-yoing and permacutting and still managed to succeed with a rapid fat loss phase and not bounce back. So fuck, dude, like give me a recipe. That, that was probably his thought process. And, you know, once again, I completely understand. And I realized in that moment that it was perhaps irresponsible of me to share my story without sufficient context and just say that, yo guys, I had a terribly unhealthy nutritional behavior, but I stopped tracking my macros and I got ripped within a month and now all is good. Now, you know, it's not exactly what I said. In fact, I did mention that around that time, I did have something kind of life-changing happening to me and that I met someone who showed me after a long time what it's like to be alive. And that co-occurred co with the start of my intuitive eating journey, but probably that was still not enough context. And I guess this is why this guy started off by saying that I met a girl that I'm excited about because he wanted to indicate that, hey, I'm in the same boat as you were in, so how do I replicate your getting ripped process in a month? And, you know, I may have come across to this guy as a bit reclusive or a bit standoffish because I was reluctant to take this discussion in a direction of, yeah, man, this is what I did. You can do it, too, because what I did had so much context behind it that it would have taken me ages to let him know everything. And so this is what I want to use this episode for. Uh, hopefully it won't take me an hour, but basically I want to tell you everything that stand behind that transformation that I experienced at the time. And, you know, if this episode will be just a long rambling bullshit for everybody else, except for this guy who hears this, that's also fine, you know. But I'm pretty sure that at least a couple of people amongst you can resonate with this story. So, first of all, let's outline my situation at the time before my fat loss phase in a few minutes. So, you know, around that time um, and in the many months preceding that time, I was in a state of having gone through maybe three cutting periods to about 10% body fat, after all of which I essentially blew right back up. I was not able to maintain my leanness. I was not able to maintain my leanness. And that was not because I was so hungry that I couldn't resist eating more food. That was because over time I engineered an environment for myself in which food was essentially the only source of hedonic pleasure in my life. And when I say that, I really mean more so the behaviors around food. So I was never really a foodie. Like It's not like I was addicted to eating super tasty foods. It was more so a set of behaviors, such as going a bit hungry during the day, go and work out, and then spending my evenings in the state of withdrawing to my little sanctuary and eating my giant post-workout meals, and after which I would just feel stuffed and bloated and a bit disgusted by myself deep down kind of knowing that this is not really a way to be. Uh, but then the next day, rinse repeating. And that's the behavior that I was hooked on and I couldn't really break free from. And I had several reasons for this. For one, I really lost touch with the people around me socially, uh, in good part because I just couldn't really relate to their means of having fun after some time. I also struggled with having a sense of purpose in life. I mean, my podcast and online work did provide me with a sense of purpose, but for a long time, I would listen to someone like uh, Mike Matthews when he talked about business and would just get discouraged and, uh, quote, realize that I'll never make it to anything. Uh, when it comes to my studies and the potential work life that my studies offered, it also didn't provide me with a great outlook on the future, so I was just not in a good spot in that regard. Now, I don't want this work outlook part of the story to, I don't want to pose this as a major reason for being miserable. I wouldn't say that looking back, my life situation was absolutely terrible in this regard. It was just simply a confusing, annoying period. But I think that's okay. You know, in some regards, it still is the case. But now I understand that uh, that's just kind of the part of life at, at this stage of many of our lives. You know, I think that for many of us, 
that's what our 20s are about. That's when we are still young, but are also not kids anymore. You know, we start to mature in some aspects of our lives, but in other aspects, we are still very much kids. Um, and at the same time, the world places a lot of expectations of us. We see people around us getting ahead in life while we are not there ourselves and we feel insecure about it. We compare ourselves to other people and think that could be me or that should be me. And in the meantime, our priorities and values might also form a little bit. So, you know, we, or I should say I, devalue some things that used to be of value, such as getting wasted in some bar and start valuing some other things, such as, you know, getting ahead in life, progressing as a thinker as and as an individual. So all of these things have created a weird state in my head. And again, I'm still in that state in many regards where a lot of things are unbelievably exciting, like what will I do with my life? But at the same time, that same question was and is unbelievably intimidating. Like, what the hell will I do with my life? And on top of all of this, because of my changed values and changed priorities and the reduced social interactions I had as a consequence, an incredibly big void got formed in my life. Um, and on some days, I literally had this conversation with myself where I would go home in the evening and I would think, okay, I know that if I'll eat now, I will blow my macros, but what the actual fuck else am I supposed to do with my time? So I got home and repeated the same cycle. So that was the state that I was in. No social life, no real interests and hobbies other than you know working out and playing some video games. And all my ideas about my future were a giant big mess. So in this not so ideal spot, I went through several yo-yo episodes and after some time I was burnt out on dieting to the max. And in the meanwhile, meanwhile, I was also unhappy with my body, which is generally a bad combination. Typically the situation in which I would generally recommend someone to proceed with my standard recommendation of at least a month, but preferably more of maintenance, and then do what you feel like and do a cut if you want. And while at the time I didn't understand that in a situation like that, basically the only thing that can get someone out of this vicious cycle was maintenance eating for a while, because I was so burnt out on dieting that even the thought of starting out with a several week fat loss phase again disgusted me to even think about, I kind of started doing that anyway. So I just kind of started to eat whatever. And around that time, so this would have been 2017 May, I also did start to live a little. So, you know, I just started to go on a few dates which I hadn't done for a long while. And I didn't do this as a result of any sort of special, I need to start living kind of thought process. It was more so a, just a casual thing of, eh, like things are so dead, I'm not dieting anyway, so what's one thing I could do with my free time? So I went on a few dates with a, some girls. And the dates on which I went were pretty mediocre in quality, like nothing spectacular to tell you about, but it did give me back a slight feeling of just being alive. You know, like I remember the first day that I went on, I remember thinking, holy shit, like this was kind of fun. Like sitting in a bar with a girl, drinking some wine together, having some casual flirting and bonding. This was kind of cool. And certainly it was a lot cooler than sitting at home and eating my giant plate of fibrous shit while watching some YouTube video. And, you know, the whole feeling and just vibe that got to me in those moments you know, walking home on an evening in the, you know, late, warm spring weather, it just brought back a lot of old memories of having fun and going out with my friends. And it reminded me just how long ago it was that I felt this way and just how gray and predictable I had made my day-to-day -day existence with this robotic re regimented lifestyle that I fabricated for myself. So this slight realization of shit maybe I should start living, slowly started to get to me. And then came the moment of meeting this girl. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to tell you this story very concisely because it's a very long story. But even the way we met was kind of miraculous. Uh, you know, we've been just casually chatting online. We've never met before. And we were going to meet eventually, but then for a number, number of reasons, I had to leave the country I was in at the time, which was Macedonia, and go back to my home country, Hungary. 
And again, long story why, but it looked like I won't be able to go back to Macedonia ever again uh, or for a long time, mainly because of visa issues. So when I found out about all of this, I just stopped messaging her because like, what's the point? We were going to meet at least at most like one time. So I was just preparing to leave. I had already packed my bags. But then the day before I would have left Macedonia completely randomly, almost miraculously, because of like through the intervention of a mutual friend of ours that we didn't even know was a mutual friend of ours, that person kind of set us up for a date. So we ended up meeting on that day. So the day before I would have left Macedonia. And so I met her and, you know, in general, I don't believe in these things when people say, you know, that moment changed my life because your, our lives don't fucking change in one moment. You know, lives change because of repeated actions over years. And of course, I can't say that it changed my life, but I can tell you that because of that day, almost exactly nine months ago on May 30, <laughs> I am today a different person with a different outlook on things. And if on that day I don't meet her, then so many things would have been different that I can't even fathom. And why is that so? Well, for one, you know, forgive me for being too intimate here, but it was as close as it gets to, you know, love at first sight. But secondly, all of the slight feelings that started to accumulate in me over the course of the previous month of, holy shit, feeling alive is kind of good. Maybe I should start living more. On that day when I met her, all of those feelings hit me in the face so strongly. You know, I'm sure you've ha you had these moments in your life when something significant happened to you. And when you think back on the day and the surrounding hours, you can r even recall smells, the music that played in the radio or some seemingly random, irrelevant details. It is like that for me. I just remember so vividly, you know, for example, standing in this outdoor club that we were hanging out at and seeing the crowd of people around us and hearing the music, seeing the people in our group, um, you know, engaging with me in interest and, and feeling like they are interested in my company while in the meanwhile, obviously realizing that something will emerge with this girl that I'm very much attracted to and just getting that feeling once again that there is value and joy that comes from bonding with people and saying yes to random opportunities. And, you know, that feeling just got to me so hard in that moment that still, when I think back to it, I just get shivers. So had an awesome day, had an awesome night, really a time to remember. And then the next day, after all of these beautiful things that have happened, I woke up realizing that I have X, X amount of hours until my flight is coming. I will have to travel back to Hungary and I will never see this girl again. I will never have fun with these people again. And what's worse, I will probably go back to my old hermit-like life where I hit the gym I eat, uh, and I eat my little meals and sometimes go out with people, but probably not much because my friends lived kind of far away from me in Hungary and it takes a lot of time to get to the city center. And those nights aren't as much fun anyway. And Macedonia was so awesome. And this girl and fuck, you know, in that moment, it hit me that I was so close to having the best summer of my life. And finally, I met someone that I was truly excited about. And within a few hours, this was all taken away from me. And so I got on the plane and left. And, you know, the pain that I felt on, on the plane and while waiting for that plane was so intense that I, once again, I just haven't felt anything like that for a long while. And that pain got to me stronger and stronger as the day went on. So, you know, I got on the plane by 10 a.m. And by the time I got home and threw off my bags and sat on my bedside was around maybe 2 or 3 p.m. or so. And the only thing that was on my mind was, what the fuck have I done? Like, why did I do this? I could have stayed there. It was one of those moments when, you know, it's like when you wake up from some terrible nightmare and just think, oh God, like so good, this was just a dream. It was one of those moments and I was just waiting for the moment where I would wake up, except that I didn't wake up, it was very real. So I was just sad and crushed beyond, beyond explanation really. And, uh, you know, anytime you go through some temporary emotional trauma, usually the way it goes is that a part of you is thinking about how things will be from now on and how you will quote unquote survive this. And another part of you is thinking about whether there is really no hope anymore. And that's how I was too. And so I started Googling around looking for ways in which I could still go back somehow. And it did look like there might be a way. 
And, you know, as I, as soon as I saw that if I am pushy enough with this shit, I could make this happen. I was like, okay, I'm fucking going back there. And then knowing that I may go back there and may have the chance to have an awesome couple of months, at least for a short term period. Honestly, my excitement and just fired upness was really on, only comparable to some little kid who just decided that he'll take over the world. And after some time, it became clear that it was indeed possible for me to return to Macedonia. And in that moment, I was like, okay, I'll go back there and I'll return as the best fucking version of myself. And honestly, I didn't even think much of fat loss for a good while. What was a lot more important to me is that I get out of this terrible state in which food and my body composition neuroses were control in my life. And the way in which I decided to achieve this is first and foremost by quitting tracking my food altogether. I was like, I don't want to know that I have X amount of calories left or that another spoonful means this many extra calories. No, I'm just going to start to act like a person for whom food and eating is an afterthought and his life is ruled by other much more important things. I didn't care about fat loss because you know, I was like 16-ish percent body fat, and I knew fully well from past experiences that the average girl who is not familiar with fitness standards will think that I look freaking amazing at 16% body fat. So I certainly didn't fool myself by thinking that, ooh, if I only got back to this girl shredded, she would think I'm some Adonis or whatever. No, it was much more important to me that if I see her again, that then I will be the person whose self-esteem is not needlessly degraded by the fact that, you know, I have a completely messed up relationship with food. So I just started eating without tracking. I told myself that I have the unconditional permission to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, as much as I want, but I will eat very mindfully and focus on the act of eating. And once I'm done with my meal, I'll just move on and have fun and entertain myself in some other fucking way. And if my body composition stays the same, that's completely fine. And if I lose fat, that's also fine. So with that, let's talk about fat loss because you have to understand, and hopefully by now you understand that there were just a ton of things playing to my advantage here. For one, my mind state, which the recent pain, then the small amount of hope that I got, and then the excitement that, holy shit, I will reunite with this girl soon, I was basically in a constant state of high adrenaline. You know, the feeling when someone emotionally very intense happens to you, and you just feel like your stomach is the size of a small stone? That's how I felt there. Secondly, even though I knew that focusing on your food and eating without distraction can be very powerful, it still kind of stunned me how good I felt after eating, relatively speaking, very little amounts of food. So for a good while, just by eating mindfully, focusing on my food, even though I was almost certainly eating much less food, so I was in a sizable deficit, I literally felt better and better every day, which in retrospect is, of course, not a huge surprise. I mean, prior to that, I was used to eating my meals in front of my laptop or while listening to something, just ignoring all my satiety signals completely and eat to the point of feeling stuffed, bloated, and, and just grossed out. Now, I stopped each meal when I felt really freaking good and before I would have gotten stuffed. And I think this in a way, was, for lack of a better term, a huge shock to my brain. Like, holy shit, we are actually perceiving all these satiety signals because we are no longer being distracted by some podcast or video. Like, oh my God, okay, we are full. Thank you very much. It's enough. So in the initial two weeks, I was getting by on, relatively speaking, very, very little food. But I literally felt better and better throughout the whole process. I mean, I was not food focused, nor was I hungry, really. Now, an important distinction here to make... Had I been in my old ways of not having any purpose and nothing really that would have excited me, this experience would have been very, very different. So yeah, after two weeks, I was probably down by 3% body fat, maybe four. So probably I was down to at maybe 12% body fat from 15 or even 16 within two weeks, which I mean, technically that's a crash diet. And I don't recommend people at 15% body fat, fat to freaking crash diet, especially not when they just had a history of yo-yoing, permacutting, etc. But this is what you need to understand here. Because of this unique mind state I was in, 
it didn't feel like a crash diet for me. In fact, I, it didn't even feel like a diet at all. It felt like a re-normalizing process, if you will. And the only time it crossed my mind that, whoa, man, we are getting pretty lean here. Let's make a final push and let's get even leaner and a bit shredded. That was around the time when I was maybe 11, 12% body fat. So yeah, at that point, I got a little bit greedy. But before that, not at all. But once again, I can't possibly hammer this point home anymore that even as recently as maybe a month prior to that, this would have been an absolute terrible idea. So I met this girl on May 30. If you just took me same person at May 29, so one day prior to that, it would have been an absolute disaster of an idea to try to attempt a fat loss phase. Like that person right there should have done a two months maintenance phase and maybe then a cut because he had no trust in himself that he could maintain his fat loss results, whatever they would have been. Frankly, he probably didn't even have the mental agility at the time to even start out with the fat loss phase. And, you know, he would have needed a period of just normalcy because you can't just flip your entire mindset over with a click of a switch overnight unless something happens that does it for you. And to me, this did it. So by the time this fat loss phase was over, was basically when I reunited with this girl. And everything was what I hoped that it would be. I had an awesome summer. We started dating with her and I maintained my fat loss results effortlessly because through that entire summer, I was in this aroused, hyped up state. And the thing is, over time, this, of course, tapered off. So, you know, by maybe October or so, things kind of settled down. I was not partying as much. The craze of the summer period kind of went away. And I did find myself settling back to a relatively predictable routine. And, you know, I did start having days again when I would just start living my life kind of robotically. And I would just wake up, go to the office, hit the gym, go home. And, you know... That was the pattern in which, I mean, the last time I was having that kind of a lifestyle was when I had all my problems. And then I got a little bit of a reality check that, okay, dude, you had the fun of your life, you fell in love, you partied a lot, but you were walking on clouds and that allowed you to be on track nutritionally too, but now what? I mean, life is not always a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do when things are just normal. I mean, it's easy to do the right things when everything is super intense and awesome and turned up to the highest gear. But when things are just normal, when it's just a random cloudy October afternoon, then what? And you know, there's a couple of things that allowed me to still be on track. For one, the habits that I built up save me. So because for so many months I was eating mindfully without being distracted by web surfing and listening to podcasts and all that shit, by then it became an ingrained habit. The other thing is that once you have done something that really sabotaged your well-being and happiness for a long while, at times it's hard to break free from those actions when you're in the midst of it because you're so deep in the woods that you're kind of blinded from even the fact that you're actively messing with yourself. And there is always the insidious pull of the thing that you're currently accustomed to because it's known. So in my case, at some point, I was aware that not having a social life and spending my evenings at home, stuffing myself full of some high fiber concoction that I made is kind of sucking life out of me. But I didn't have the courage to make a change because at least this shit was familiar. But when eventually you do break free from whatever behavior you trapped into and experience something else and you ride that new thing out too, then you can look back and evaluate which lifestyle is worth it. And so, you know, when I would just think back of how I lived and how I felt during those earlier times before coming out to the light, so to speak, it would just make my heart sink. And I would just think, no fucking way I'm going back to that again. And the third thing is, is that I do think that I fundamentally changed my outlook on life. And, you know, I talked about this here and there. You can check the yearly review episode that I've done. But, you know, the key thing here is that now I understand that experience, human connection, excitement, these sorts of things are needed every once in a while at least. 
And, you know, my earlier times of suffering and being isolated, partially that all stemmed from this romantic idea that I had that I can really find meaning and excitement in life by sitting in front of my laptop at home. You know, I had this idea of sitting on the couch, banging on my laptop keyboard and build up some online empire and being super productive. And hey, as a bonus, while I'm doing all of this, I can go to the gym and eat my meals whenever I feel like this is so cool. And that somehow by doing this, I'll get into this flow state and find meaning through my online work. And you know, part of this belief was due to my naivete, but part of it was just playing it safe. And that's, I would say, what changed the most in my outlook is that I am fucking done with playing it safe. You know, I tried it. I tried engineering my environment in such a way that it eliminated uncertainty and it was very safe. It has its very clear benefits in eliminating unpredictability and being put in situations where what happens to you is somewhat down to the decisions and preferences of other people. You're very much shielded from being hurt unexpectedly. But all of this also has a way of just sucking life out of you. And, and you know, I have the mindset now, and I'm trying to hold on to this mindset, that I want to live life in the danger zone. Like, I want to expose myself to getting hurt, getting crushed, but also to have amazing life-changing experiences. And now I have these funny situations when someone suggests me, for example, do you want to go skiing? And my first reaction is, fuck, I haven't skied in like eight years. And the last time I did, I fucking torn my ACL. I don't want to ski again and re-tear it. If I injure my leg and I can't train, I'll go freaking insane. But my second thought is, God damn it that they asked me because that means that I'm going. Because once again, I'm done with playing it safe. And you know, over the past few months, I had people asking me who listened to my podcast and knew me before, uh, you know, things such as, have you taken something psychedelic? You sound so enlightened. And my response is, no, I haven't taken anything. But yeah, I am enlightened. I did come out to the light in a way. So, man, I came really far from the fat loss topic, but I just wanted to illustrate that my mindset when I went through that rapid fat loss phase was not like, oh, there is this girl, I want to impress her with my six pack. It was so much more than that. And you know, the big challenge now is to find ways to hold on to this mindset no matter what. So, you know, for example, if I break up with this girl, so by the way, nine months later, this girl is still my girlfriend, so that's kind of good news. But if we break up and, you know, if I get into an environment again, say I go back to my home country, how will I keep this mindset that I currently have? And how will I not regress back into playing it safe? And that's, of course, a very big question. So sometimes I do think about different things that I could do um, and I constantly think about ways in which, you know, I can create a sense of obsession and a sense of excitement in my life. But, you know, to make this a little bit more general and not just to make it solely about me and my story, there are a couple of really big lessons for me from this story. The first one is something that I had known for a while, uh, partially through my, my self-education in, in fitness and psychology, and also through personal experiences. But it was nice to see this concept take effect in real life. And that's the notion of behavior first, attitude second. So in the case of me and this girl, for example, who later became my girlfriend, something drastic happened that fundamentally reshaped the way I think. And it started a huge snowballing of events. But all of that started off with this little decision from my end, which was that I'm just going to start dating a little bit. And that was not during a time when my confidence was at some super high level. Like putting myself out there on the dating market, that was not really what was the obvious step or the sort of behavior that was congruent, if you will, um, with the state that I was in at the time. I mean, I was low in confidence. I was unhappy with my body. I had little recent practice in social situations. Everything about the whole idea of dating and going out was just kind of scary and strange. And for whatever reason, I just decided to go ahead and try it anyway. And once I've made that first step and I let the subsequent events to take effect on me a little, then almost as a consequence, my attitude started to change too. And a few months down, down the line, I very much felt like a person who had a completely different internal environment in his head, where I felt much more confident, outgoing, had a lot more belief in myself, 
but it all started out with me taking action first. And, you know, this goes very much against how a lot of us tend to envision how this process plays out, which is that you have this long period of contemplation, you reconsider things, you make a few realizations, you fix your self-esteem, and once you're ready, you go out and take action, which I'm not saying that that doesn't work, but I, now that I think about it, I can think back to so many times when I decided to do something even though I didn't feel like it and my mood and attitude changed as a consequence. But on the other hand, I can think of a lot of times, take my messed up eating behaviors, when I knew, you know, for a long time I knew that this is not cool, I'm sabotaging my own well-being with this behavior, it's ruining my life, and still I was gravitating back towards the same action set again and again. And I think this is for the simple reason that these things are often not rationally thought out things that we follow through with. When we have a bad habit or when we are reluctant to, to, to take something on that we feel would benefit us, but we are too scared to get started with it, it's not like a lack of good understanding is what's preventing us from doing the right thing. These things simply often have a strong habitual component. Often they have a strong emotional compulsion component. So contemplating over it is often just not a viable way to get around these things. Another lesson from this, and again, this is something that I had known for a while, but it was nice to see it being reinforced in practice, is that nutrition for the most part is about things that you don't do. It's not about the things that you actively pursue. And this is what makes this whole game especially tricky. I think that with other pursuits in life, basically the more you do of certain things, the better your results. Like um, with work, for example. Generally speaking, the more time you spend thinking about your business or simply the more work you put into the whole process, basically the better your results are going to be. With nutrition, it's a different ballgame because the biggest component of nailing down your nutrition is to refrain from doing certain things. And in a game like this, you can't win effectively if you spend the majority of your time thinking about it and being preoccupied with it. It's kind of like sleeping, which I can tell you a lot about. When you're laying in bed, uh, waiting to fall asleep and thinking, okay, am I falling asleep? Am I falling asleep? You're never fucking going to fall asleep. If you, however, let your thoughts to wander, start thinking about other random stuff, now you can actually succeed in this mini game called falling asleep. So while I think, yes, establishing good habits with food, using some smart strategies, such as some of those that I talked about in a lot of my episodes, that's probably the biggest component of succeeding in nutrition. But probably another huge part of all of this is just finding excitement in life in general. You know, finding things that fire you up, that make you want to wake up in the morning, and that at times can cause some sleepless nights. I guess I could close off with some hugely motivational segment here, but that would just feel kind of off. So I'll go practical and instead. Uh, that's basically the story of me going from 16-ish percent body fat to 9-ish in a month. And are there situations in which a rapid fat loss phase is viable, even though everything in life would indicate that that's a terrible idea? Yes. If something drastically intense flips your entire life on its head, then it may be appropriate. And when that happens, you'll know it. And if you have to ask yourself whether you're in that boat, chances are that it's not appropriate. When I did my rapid cut, I didn't have to ask myself. I knew that there was absolutely zero chance that I would regress into anything in that context. If you were not in the situation I was in at the time, odds are that you're better off sticking to my general recommendation, which is renormalize and then fix up. And with that, my question to you today is, what is your number one obsession in life that could make you forget about all of your bad habits? All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please leave a comment and subscribe if you watch this on YouTube. If you listen to this on iTunes, please leave a rating to help this stuff grow. SoundCloud and Podbeam, you can just follow me to be notified on future episodes. And to be a contributing member of this podcast, join the Sustainable Self-Development Facebook group where you can drop ideas about future podcasts. I very often ask my listeners for tips and advice on who to 
get on next. So if you're interested in getting into discussions like that, be sure to join the Facebook group. And if you don't want to go through the searching process, just click one of those links in the show notes slash video description. It is all there. All right. Thanks for hanging around up until now and see you next time.